Hello, everyone. Welcome to our second annual A National YLF event. I'm so glad that you all have joined us today. Um, my name is Sarah Goldman, and I am going to be the facilitator of our event today. Um, my position is that I am the facilitator of the event, and I am from our Florida Youth Leadership Forum. So I was a delegate back in 2007. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and I am a woman with blondish brown hair. I am wearing a black shirt and my background is white with the Association of Youth Leadership Forums, AYLF, um, with a bird swooped with our logo as my background. Um, and so I just wanna give a couple announcements as we kick off and get started today. If you are not already on mute, please make sure that you are on mute. Um, we will have a chance for Q&A later, and if so, we will go ahead and meet you at that time. So for now, please go ahead and mute yourself if you are not already. If you do not want to be on camera, we do have today's session being recorded. So if that's not something you're comfortable with, with having your picture up on a recording, you can go ahead and turn your camera off for the portion of this event. Um, I want to remind you of the raise hand and chat feature. So we've got the chat on the side. Feel free to type in questions. We're going to have a chance in a couple of minutes for everybody to tell us where they're from. Um, so you for now can say hello to each other in the chat. And also the raise hand function for when we do have our speakers later. If we have time for Q&A, we will be using that so that we can call on you to ask a question. If that's the case, we will then ask you to turn on your video if you would like to be spotlighted next to our speaker. If your video is not on when we call on you, then we unfortunately cannot spotlight you on screen. So just keep note of that as we go through today. If you would like to ask a question, um, have your video on when you raise hand. And if you don't feel comfortable having your video on, no problem, we do not have to spotlight you. So those are just a couple of housekeeping announcements. We are going to have a couple speakers. We're gonna have a panel we have our keynote speaker, uh, Jennifer Keelan Schaefens, who was big at the Capitol Crawl for the Americans with Disabilities Act. She will be joining us in just a little bit. But for now, I am going to turn it over to Carrie Greenwood, who is our AYLF chair. So Carrie, take it away. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. <clears throat> uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Let me know if you can. Um, but yeah, my name is Carrie Greenwood. I serve as the chairperson for the Association of Youth Leadership Forums. Um, I'm also the coordinator of the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum. So I live in Kansas and um, we actually just finished our YLF last week. So it's exciting to kind of like be back in the YLF world and see so many of you guys from all over the country. We really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to be here with us today. Let me give kind of a description of myself. Um, oh, and I didn't state that I'm an alumni of the Youth Leadership Forum as well. I attended the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum in 2001. So, uh, so I, I'm a part of that family as well uh, of alumni from across the nation. So visual description of myself, I am a Caucasian female in my late 30s. Um, I have kind of a bob cut, short shortish hair um kind of brownish colored hair uh today i'm wearing kind of a greenish teal shirt and um i am sitting i'm actually at my sister's house sitting in one of her rooms with kind of a white closet behind me and a window off to my to the side of me so that's kind of a visual description of myself i again would like to welcome you guys to a second Hi, Carrie. This is Danielle. Your audio cut out. Uh, a YLF National. Um, and it very sounds familiar. Oh, it did. Can you guys hear me okay? Sounds like you're back. <laughs> okay. Sorry. It might be the internet. Sorry about that. Can you hear me okay now, Danielle? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Just tell me again if that happens. Again, it might just be the internet of where I'm at. Sorry about that. Um, but again, I just want to welcome you guys to the, the second annual Association of Youth Leadership Forums National Virtual Event. 
uh, as I was saying before, we started this last year and it was definitely a great success. And so we knew that we wanted to do it again and um, you know, just bring alumni from all over the country together to celebrate celebrate advocacy, celebrate this amazing program that has changed so many of our lives. And so I'm really, really excited to see how many people that we have here today. It looks like at the moment we have 80, 81 participants. Um, and so that's fantastic. I think last year we had around, I was at 100, I believe. So we're, we're close to that. Hopefully we'll get a few more that will that will come on here. Let me tell you a little bit more about the Association of Youth Leadership Forums. Um, I'm gonna, I just wanna read like our official mission so you guys know what this organization is all about. Uh, it is the purpose of the Association of Youth Leadership Forums to improve employment and independent living outcomes of youth with disabilities transitioning from high school by promoting throughout the United States and its territories, the replication of the California model youth leadership forum for students with disabilities or YLF. I know that was kind of a long explanation, but basically the Association of Youth Leadership Forums works to bring together YLFs from across the country. Um, we gather as coordinators once a month to kind of talk about, you know, things that are going in our states, share ideas with each other, um, you know, share uh, tips and tricks and things like that. But we are also definitely working to also bring alumni from across the nation together as well. Hence this national virtual event that we're having today. So again, it looks like we are at 82 participants at this point. Um, as Sarah kind of mentioned earlier, we have a full agenda for you guys today. Uh, we will be on here for about two hours. And throughout that time, actually, we have a couple of awesome speakers today, um, one being Rebecca Coakley. Rebecca, it's so good to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, so we'll give an introduction to her here in a minute. We have a panel that is going to talk about advocacy and making change in your community. And then, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we also have Jennifer Keelan here with us, who is going to share her experiences and her story with being involved with the Capitol Crawl at a very young age um, and the, the change that was made through that and how that has kind of spurred her advocacy work throughout the years or, or over the years. So that's a very quick overview of what today is going to look like. Um, but we would like to kind of start, let me see if I covered everything that I was supposed to cover. Okay, so we do want to know where everyone is from today. And I'm seeing it in the chat. Everybody's kind of like, hey, from California, hey, from Florida. So we really want to see where all of you are from. So uh, Sarah is going to share the screen. And you guys are going to see a map on the screen of the United States. And what I'm going to have you do is at the very top of your screen, um, it's, it probably says you are viewing Sarah Goldman's Florida YLF screen. And so someone's drawing on there right now. I believe that's Sarah. So next to that, it says view options. And if you click on annotate, that is going to bring up a bunch of kind of like drawing uh, things that you can do. And so what we would like you to do is to either pick a stamp or the drawing utensil. I'm just going to pick the stamp and the heart. And then wherever your state is at, you're just gonna click or wherever you're at in your state, you can click. And I just did Kansas for myself. So go ahead and click where you're from so that we can kind of see an overview of where everyone is coming from. We do realize that the annotate, it may not be accessible for everyone. So if that is the case, feel free to just put in the chat uh, what maybe what city and state that you're from so we can kind of see where everybody is coming from. So I'll give you guys a second to do that. And I'll just kind of give a description of what's happening right now. So it looks like we've got, of course, quite a few people from California. Oh, gosh, you guys are going to test my, my knowledge here. Florida. Um, let's see, where, where else? This? What was that? Where do you find this, the annotate? So up at the top of your screen, it says that you are viewing Sarah Goldman's screen. And then next to that, it says view options. If you click view options, you're gonna see annotate. And that brings up a few other um, things that you can click on. I see it. Okay, awesome. South Carolina looks like someone. Again, I, I'm not good at my states here. So North Carolina, okay. 
Hey, Carrie. Yes. So I can't. F so you said options, right? Um, up at the top of your screen, it's going to say you're viewing Sarah Goldman's screen. And next to that, it says view options. And then if you click on view options, it'll bring down kind of a drop down and it'll say annotate. It doesn't say annotate, but I just hmm. typed in Oklahoma City. But okay. I am on a Chromebook, so yeah. Uh, if, yeah, it could be different on different devices. That's that's not impossible. Sorry about that. You're fine. All right, quite a few from California. Again, I'm not sure. Let's see, South Carolina, Oklahoma. Arizona's in the house. Arizona, thank you. Yes, I was trying to, there we go. It does say AZ. I was trying to figure out what state that was. I should have had a, a map with all the states on it in front of me. Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahoma, okay, perfect. All right. Anyone else want to put their state on there? Ohio. Awesome, thanks. Fantastic. Looks like we might have a, is that a Montana maybe? Okay, I've got a lot of South Carolina in the house today. Illinois, okay, perfect. Ohio. Okay, wonderful. Well, it, we'll leave that up there for just a second if you wanna add your state to it. Thank you guys so much for letting us know where you're coming from. It's great to see that we do have representation from multiple multiple states throughout the US. So again, thank you guys for doing that. And thanks for being here. We have a couple of hands up. Did you guys have a question? It looks like Gibby? I'm for the state that I'm in. What was that? For the state that I'm in, I'm in Nevada County in California. Nevada. Oh, okay. Oh, Nevada County. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Hey. Okay. All right, you guys. Well, thank you again for doing that. We oh, we're at 99 plus people on the call now. That's exciting. Well, I think with that, let me just make sure I covered everything here. Okay. I think that I am going to go ahead and pass it back to Sarah. And, you know, one of the staples, I think, of a lot of YLFs is that we like to do cheers. And so we're going to do a little cheer today. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Sarah to lead you guys in a YLF cheer. Thanks, Carrie. I love getting to, getting to see where everybody is coming from. And I see the chat is still blowing up of all the different groups and all the different states that are being represented today. So we're so glad that you all took time out of your Days. I know Florida's YLF is next week. Woohoo. Kansas just finished theirs. California's got theirs going on this week. I know Arizona's got theirs. So I know everybody is busy and we really do appreciate you all taking time to come on and, and join us today. Um, so what I am going to do now is introduce a couple of people from California. So we've got Matt Baker, Ben Harris, and Gavin Sue. So we'll give them a minute to get spotlighted. And they are going to drop a document in the chat. Um, and they are going to lead you in some YLF cheers. So they will go over that. And when we are ready, we will have you all unmute yourself um, so we can all say them out loud together at one time. Um, the interpreter should stay pinned. So if anybody loses the interpreter for any reason that needs one, just go to the top right hand corner and click pin to the interpreter and that will keep them on the screen should they get lost when everybody goes and does the cheers. So it looks like Jen dropped the cheers in the chat if anybody wants to open them up and read them out loud, but I am gonna turn it over to California YLF to take it away with the cheers. Thank you, Sarah. We appreciate you all. We are excited. National YLF happening today. This is our second year. And so we want everyone to bring the energy. We wanna rock the house. So if you're at home, we want your windows vibrating. We want, if your parents are there, we want them to be like, whoa, what's going on? 
So we just want to show all of our YLF energy and have an opportunity to share with everyone. I see Isabella, you asked in the chat, where do I find the pin? The good thing is our interpreter is still spotlit. So you do not have to worry about that. Uh, you should be able to see the interpreter, myself, Jen Harris, Matt Baker, and Gavin Sue. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I'm Jen Harris. My, um, I'm a black woman with uh, hair down, twisted. My virtual background has a uh, rainbow colored glitter and it says California Youth Leadership Forum for Students with Disabilities and it has our YLF logo. Uh, I will pass it to Gavin and Matt. All right, my name is Gavin Sue. I'm also a co-facilitator this week at the California YLF. Uh, I, I have he, him pronouns as well. I mean, I have he, him pronouns and um, I have brown hair, uh, tan skin. I, the background is the YLF Beach logo. And yeah, I'm excited to lead you through some cheers. I'll pass it to Matt. Hey everyone, good morning. My name is Matt Baker. I use he, him pronouns. I'm a counselor this year at California YLF. Go Greensters 2.0. Um, I'm used, I'm a young-ish Asian American man. I wear glasses, I have pink hair, and I'm using the YLF virtual background, the morning sunrise. And we're here to lead you all through some cheers. Yay, so with that, I think we can each take a turn in leading a cheer. Would one of you like to go first? Okay, I'll start Greensboro, it off. Greensboro, North Carolina. All right, so we have North Carolina in the house, Oklahoma, uh, Florida, Arizona, so many areas. So everyone should have received in the chat, Matt and myself both put the cheers in the chat. Uh, you should, if you click it and you download it, you'll be able to open it. So I'm thinking the cheer that I want to start off with is we'll do YLF uh, or Yelp, 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 as we like to say. And so I'm going to say, give me a Y and then you're going to go Y. So in sign language, this would be representative of Y. And then I'm going to say, give me an L and you're going to go like this. And you're going to say L. I'm going to say, give me an F and you're going to go like this, F. And then I'm going to say, what does that spell? And then we're all going to go, yo, 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 yo. All right. So let's try that out a couple of times. Ready? And please unmute yourselves. We want to hear you. So everyone get ready. Let's unmute. Here we go. Give me a Y. 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 Give me an L. 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 N F. L. What does that spell? All right, one more time. Give me a Y. Y. Give me an L. L. Give me an F. L. Does that spell? No. Awesome. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Okay, I love the YLF is dynamite cheer. So I'm going to lead you all through that. So I'm going to say YLF is what? And you'll respond dynamite. And then I'll say YLF is what? And then you'll respond dynamite. And then we'll all say YLF is tick, 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 boom, dynamite. And the ticks don't really matter how many, um, but... Yeah, the boom dynamite is the most important thing. So let's try it out, everyone. YLF is what? Dynamite. YLF is what? Dynamite. YLF is Let's do it one more time. YLF is what? Dynamite. YLF is what? Dynamite!
Go ahead, Gavin. Dynamite. All right. Dynamite. All right. I'm going to lead you guys through the last year. So the last year, all we, all you got to say is we're here, we're loud, we're disabled, and proud. And then you repeat mm -hmm. that three times, but each time you do it, you just get progressively louder. So you guys ready for that? Yep. Yes. All right. Yes. We're here. I was right before we're I was proud. born. We're disabled uh, and proud. proud. had to find the words to it awesome yeah. job everyone job, so i know that last one we were yeah, still trying to get that really figured funny. out right and so yeah, this is. time next year when all of you as delegates come back as staff to represent at your ylfs we want to make sure we have it good to go so with that we're going to turn it back over to you sarah thank you everyone yeah. Thank you so much, California YLF. I was Thank just you. telling some of our Florida people that we are going to teach our delegates and alumni these same chants next week. So we love our YLF cheers and we appreciate you sharing them with all of our alumni. I am happy to introduce our first speaker of the day. We are going to bring up Rebecca Coakley, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Rebecca. Rebecca is the program officer currently at the Ford Foundation. Um, she is the first ever U.S. Disability Rights Program, which is focused on strengthening the field, building a pipeline of diverse leadership, promoting disability pride, and mobilizing resources toward disability rights work. She also serves as the foundation's liaison to the President's Council for Disability Inclusion in Philanthropy. Prior to joining Ford, Rebecca was the co-founder and director of the Disability Justice Initiative, at the Center for American Progress, where she built out a progressive policy platform that protected the rights and services disabled people depend on for survival, and also developed innovative solutions like a disabled worker tax credit and increased access to capital for disability owned small businesses. She also stewarded a campaign that resulted in an unprecedented 12 presidential candidate developing disability policy platform, platforms, which is amazing. Um, prior to her work, she also served as the executive director of the National Council on Disability and has also been a three-time presidential appointee and has served in key policy roles at the Department of Education, Department of Health and Human Services, and oversaw disability and inclusion for the Obama administration. So I am so excited to introduce Rebecca Rebecca, go ahead and take it away. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Coakley. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you. A happy ADA month. Um, and it is there is nowhere else I would rather be this month to be able to celebrate the 32nd anniversary of the ADA. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Rebecca Coakley. I have achondroplasia, which is the most common form of dwarfism, shoulder length, red hair. Uh, I am coming to you from my messy living room in New Jersey, which is why my background is blurred. Um, I am wearing uh, tortoiseshell glasses, uh, a red blazer by Kathy Woods, who is the first little person clothing designer in history, um, and a black t-shirt. Uh, I, The great state of New Jersey is unceded Lenape territory. Um, and uh, all my access needs are met. So. You know, and the one thing I will say, and I'm going to embarrass him for a minute, and he probably has no idea that I know who he is. Um, but Gavin, I have, I remember when you were about six months old, I have a picture holding you at a Little People of America holiday party, like way, way back in the day. Um, and to me, that is exactly what this work is about. I, you know, there are pictures of me being held as a young child uh, by Paul Stephen Miller, who was the first person with a disability to serve as a presidential commissioner on the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. And I think the power of our community 
is that interconnectedness. Oh, I can totally find that picture, Leanne. I will, I will dig through my archives somewhere in the house and, and, and dig it up. But that's the power of our community is that the community just keeps getting bigger. And we all have the responsibility, like me, like Paul and, and those that came before me, um, to return to YLF to return to groups like the National Youth Leadership Network or the National Association of Law Students with Disabilities and continue to pay this work forward. Um, you know, to start, I wanna say that the Ford Foundation where I work right now is really committed to helping support and build the next generation of disabled leaders. I think a lot of times in movement work, we're often told that we have to be a certain age to do something or like personally, I'm not gonna lie, I hate, the term emerging leader, because I feel like at some point in time, you're expected to quote unquote, be emerged and fix everything. And like, I'm 43, and I still don't have my life together. So I don't want any of you to feel like you're behind the times on anything. Um, it's also important to remember that folks like Judy Human was 19 when she founded Disabled in Action. Justin Dart was 21 when he founded the first pro-integration group at the University of Houston. Greta Thunberg was 15 when she spoke on the floor of the Swedish parliament about climate change and the impact on young people. And Malala was 15 when she started advocating for education. Movement work is built on the backs of young people. And we need to acknowledge the tremendous amount of physical, emotional, and intellectual labor that you all put into this work. Uh, Brene Brown says that leaders take responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and who has the courage to develop that potential. And to me, that's one of the most important definitions of leadership that's out there. It's not just about yourself, but it's about who are you bringing along with you. And the second definition that I love, um, and this one's unsighted, says courageous leadership is when you're willing to be vulnerable, you're all in even though it might mean you might fail or get hurt, contrary to public opinion, vulnerable leadership is not soft or weak. I'm here to tell you that disability leadership is an asset. Let's be real. We understand non-disabled people way better than they understand us. Our disabilities give us the knowledge of what it's like to feel excluded and how to create tables that seat everyone. We understand the importance of knowing how the systems work or don't work and figuring out who is the best leverage to get us what we need. We also tremendously value the difference that one person, one action, one text message can make. But it's also a challenge. We work to know our physical, emotional, and mental limits. We have to manage what's actually possible versus what's at stake. Sometimes we find, and, and I'm seeing this on the news this morning as people are talking about President Biden, who's a person with a disability, that people might challenge our leadership or doubt our ability to lead if we lead in a way that is inclusive of our disability. And we might find ourselves challenged by the need to ask for help or support. But like I said, our movement is strong and it's ever changing and evolving. The power of the ADA is the definition of disability any mental or physical impairment that impacts activities of daily living, a history or a record of such impairments. So it's big enough to include kids in Flint, Michigan, who are still fighting for clean drinking water 3,200 days after they admitted that they were poisoning children. It's big enough to include people with alopecia areata who were specifically covered in the ADA Amendments Act like the actress Jada Pinkett Smith. It's big enough to include people with long COVID, Crohn's, IBS, fibromyalgia, and other disabilities that people have traditionally been told they were making up when they knew that they were sick. I'm here to tell you that disability rights are under attack. Every year, a bill is introduced to repeal the Americans with Disabilities Act. We just saw that bill introduced a few weeks ago in the US Congress, but we know that these are also being introduced at the state level. There's continual attempts to remove protections for people with pre existing conditions in the Affordable Care Act. Um, 
policies that are attempting to get at the very real problem that our country has with guns are specifically scapegoating students with disabilities and specifically students living with mental illness. And this is not okay. The Dobbs ruling could impact disabled people's access to abortion, access to prenatal care, and opens the door for attacks on our right to contraception and programs like IVF that would allow us to become parents. So there is never a shortage of work, but that does not mean that to be a leader in this community, that you A, have to solely work on disability issues or that you can't live the life of your dreams. I had a colleague once who told me that their dream in life was being a chef and they felt conflicted because they felt like they needed to be doing disability advocacy work. And I said, the most important advocacy work that they could be doing is be in an accessible kitchen and model what it looks like for a disabled chef to run things. So I want you to know that to do this work, you don't have to go to, dis go to law school to become a disabled lawyer. You don't have to work at a center for independent living. The important thing is that you lead from where you are and that you continue to fulfill your dreams as you're working through it. We need you. We're waiting for you to, to move forward and for you to join us in this work. And for those of you already doing the work, I'm so glad to be doing it alongside of you. Our community is infinitely strengthened by your presence, and I can't wait to see what we achieve going forward. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Great. Thank you so much, Rebecca. We appreciate your time and you being here today. This is Sarah. Um, I think you made some really great points about how we are never too young to start this work. You know, age is not a factor. So no matter how old you are, whether you are 15 and you are just starting advocacy work or you're 30 years old like I am, um, in the process of figuring out what it means to make change in the community, just know that you all are uniquely talented and gifted. And like Rebecca said, we need you and we need you to do this work. So remember that you are qualified and you are capable. All right, so we are going to transition into our panel discussion. Um, so this time we are going to bring Carrie back up. Carrie is going to facilitate our panel called Social Change, What Have You Done in the Community? So Rebecca talked about the importance of advocacy work and how we were are all able to do that. And now we're going to hear from some alumni who are actually making that real change in their communities and what they have done to impact. So Carrie is here. We are also going to bring up Isaac Zwinger Nathanson from Arizona. We're gonna bring up Anya Carrillo from Arizona and Nathan Turner from Ohio and Kendra Gottslevin, I hope I said that right, Kendra, from South Dakota. So Carrie, I am gonna turn it over to you to go ahead and facilitate our panel discussion. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Hello, panelists. Thank you guys so much for being here. We appreciate you being a part of this panel today. And I, we know that we have that you have really great stuff to share with us um, on this panel. So we're going to get to know each of you. Um, I think that we will maybe start with some introductions um, of each of you. So I'm going to go around and call on each of you. And if you guys could introduce yourself with your name, uh, your pronouns, and then give us a brief audio description of yourself and kind of, you know, what's what your background is, as well as what state that you're representing, even though Sarah kind of already told us that, um, and the year that you were a delegate. I know that was a lot, so let me repeat. Your name, uh, your pronouns, audio description of yourself and your background, the state that you're representing, and the year that you were a delegate. So I'm just going to start with the first person on my screen, which is Anya. Do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, hello, my name is Anya Carrillo. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm wearing a black dress with a mustard colored um, wrap with colorful flowers all over it. I am also wearing glasses and have medium um, brown length hair. And my background, I have a white screen in the back with a lampshade. I tried to move the lampshade out of the way, but um, the lampshade is there. Um, and I am a graduate from Arizona Youth Leadership Forum, um, 2014. Fantastic, thank you, Anya. Kendra, how about you? My name is Kendra Gottsleben and my pronouns are she, her. Um, I have blue glasses. I have uh, shoulder length 
brown blondy hair. Uh, my background is blurred because I've got a lot going on in my background. I have shelves and everything. I'm in my office. I represent uh, South Dakota. And I was a delegate a long time ago, back in 2004. I think I got all the things that we were supposed to say. Yes, I think you did. Thanks, Kendra. And I, I've got you beat. I was a delegate in 2001. So it's you're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nathan, how about you? Well, oh, oh, OK, can everybody hear me now? I had an issue with my microphone, so I apologize. Yeah, I think we can hear you. We can hear you. OK, great. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Nathan Turner. I am from Ohio. I participated in the Ohio Youth Leadership Forum in 2005. I'm really active, well, in, in Ohio's Developmental Disabilities Network particularly, and I, I'm contracting with about uh, five grantees in the network and, and specializing advocacy around the direct care crisis, around employment, around transportation, and rights assertiveness and education. Thank you. Did I hit everything? If I didn't, I apologize. Nathan, can you give a visual description of yourself and your background, please? Oh, yes. I, I do not do very good at that, so I apologize <laughs> if it sucks. I am in front of a white background for Developmental Disabilities Awareness Day in Ohio, and I have short black hair and a short black beard. I use he pronouns, and I'm wearing a bright green shirt. Okay. You did great. Thank you. Okay, and Isaac, you. how about you, Isaac? Hi, everyone. My name is Isaac Zwinger Nathanson. I am a, uh, I use he, him pronouns. I am representing the uh, Arizona Youth Leadership Forum. I graduated in uh, 2017. And I am a Asian American uh, with short-ish brown hair, uh, black hair. Uh, I have the Aurora Borealis as my background. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Okay, so as Sarah mentioned, the title of, of this panel is Social Change, What Have You Done? So we're going to talk today a lot about, you know, not only how has YLF impacted your life, but how has it led to you advocating for change in your communities? Um, we're going to talk about, you know, how, how the the other alumni that are on our call today can make change in their own communities. And so I've basically got a list of questions here that I'm going to ask you guys and We'll just kind of go around the group and have each person answer. So we're going to start with one of my favorite questions, and I'm really excited to hear what you guys answered to this one, which is, how did YLF impact your life, and how has it led to where you are now? So I think I'll go backwards this time, um, if that's okay with you guys. So Isaac, tell us a little bit about how YLF impacted your life and how it has led you to be where you're at today. So YLF has um, been a huge part of my life because I've made it a huge part of my life. Um, when I first came on, on the scene, I didn't know that um, I needed them as much as they needed me, um, thinking that it was just another you know, opportunity to put on my resume. But I fell in love with, with what, what we were promoting and what we do here in Arizona, as well as across the country. Um, I um, did a lot of disability work for the um, National Federation of the Blind, but really fell in love with the independent living movement and cross disability advocacy. Um, and so I, you know, fell in love with that and continued to come back as a staff and and facilitator um, for our for our form. Um, it's led me led to very awesome opportunities. I recently got to go to Alaska to represent Arizona and help get their, get them started on their uh, first uh, YLF soon. So we're going to need a new map uh, soon <laughs> so we can include Alaska in that. Um, but just being able to do cross disability advocacy and knowing about and understanding how, you know, other disability rights and how all how disability rights affect all that is affected is really important to me because i think that if we can't we you know we've been suffering to you know in silence now we need to work together to to protect and to assure that we will be 
heard um, by the by our communities. Um, I'm currently working on getting my um, my certification in as a nursing assistant, um, and so part of that has been led to you know part of that is owed to the support and um, upper, you know the support of the YLF forums um, by allowing me to just you know build my confidence in you know leading as a as a person with a disability but also paving the way for other other people with disabilities who want to go in the medical field um and or the healthcare field if, if you will um i think though it you know being able to do this at in in our age time and age is is so amazing and we you know we have a lot to offer and i'm happy to get continued the work of that that i'm um lo looking to pursue great Thank you, Isaac. I love that you're helping other states to, to start a new program. That's awesome. I love that, especially Alaska. How exciting. Okay, Nathan, what about you? How has YLF impacted your life? I think YLF has had a really fundamental impact on my life, even if I don't realize it directly. I know just I was recalling the experience of YLF when I was when I was a delegate way back in 2005 the other day with a friend and one of the things I had talked about is that for a, a lot of us that participated that year it was you know the first time kind of away from our families and yeah in that dynamic we got to create just a really cool culture amongst ourselves and start to realize you know that we all had power as people living with disabilities and that that created a unique identity and that we could help one another solve problems in ways that our systems could not address for various reasons. And I think that mindset has permeated throughout my, my advocacy that I've and done in Ohio, really trying to bring people living with disabilities together to get a sense of who they are, to know, um, to, to see themselves as what they want to be in, in spite of their conditions, because life is about living, not disability. And I think that's the core message I've learned from YLF is that, you know, it's my responsibility, kind of, as a person with a disability, to live my life and show others that it's possible to do the same and to overcome tremendous amounts of adversity to be successful in their own way. Well said, thank you. Kendra, how has YLF impacted you and brought you to where you're at today? When I was a delegate in 2004, um, one of the things was that was the first time that I had left my house, you know, like being away from parents and everything. So a lot of it was gaining independence. But what's been interesting is the journey I have taken uh, currently where I work now is um, called the Center for Disabilities here in South Dakota. And I've been here for 11 years and I do marketing and communications. So what's funny is I work at the state entity here, but with my job here, I've been able to, after leaving YLF and going on to college and getting my degrees and stuff, once I got my job here, I got reconnected, you know, with the uh, YLF staff and they had me back as mentor. I've been back as a speaker. I work with them in grants in my job because we kind of work together in other assets. So what's been fun is even though I was a delegate many years ago, everything that I learned in that while well, there, definitely all the leadership skills um, made me realize that I have a voice and how my leadership skills can help others. I've written three books. I just started a nonprofit 
for regarding people with disabilities and I have a rare disease. So I kind of wear two hats in that world. But so my passion, you know, YLF kind of helped me see the leadership skills that I had, I have, that I didn't know I had, and kind of has stemmed me from going from one thing to the next. And so for me, I'm, I I don't know where I would be without uh, have been part of YLF. Thank you, Kendra. I think that would probably be what a lot of us would say. So that sound, that story sounds very familiar. Anya, how about you? How did YLF impact your life? Um, so there's a lot in my short, I guess, time that I've been a graduate. I know it's been nine years, but um, YLF has really impacted my life. Um, when I went to a YLF, I thought just like Isaac, um, that it was just going to be another summer activity for me to do, especially because I am a participant of the first YLF in Arizona. So I didn't really know what to expect. There wasn't anything I could Google and be like, okay, these are experiences that people have um, gotten from this, um, from Arizona. And I didn't know that it was a national thing either. So um, I didn't really know what to expect. So I just kind of went to escape my home life because I am a survivor of child abuse. So I was like, okay, another thing to do during the summer so I can escape this. Um, and I ended up going and falling in love with um, all the skills and the um, things that I've learned and received. Um, for me, um, I've told this to my YLF right now, we have our statewide going on right now. If you can see the Arizona Youth Leadership um, tag, that's us. Hi, guys. I love you all. Um, but um, so I've been in part of YLF ever since. I learned about my advocacy skills. I don't have many memories from 2014 till 2016 about because of the um, my um, disability, but um, I do know that after 2016, I came back as a facilitator and that's when I was like, okay, aha, I am gonna make change. Um, and even in 2014, I realized I had a voice. I got out of my situation. I made it better for myself. Um, I was able to get um, the diagnosis that was true to myself because I was um, medically abused. And I have done, okay, I've written it all out. Let me go ahead. I graduated from the YLF in 2014. And then in 2017, we started a youth engagement academy, which I also graduated from. Um, I also am a past chair of the youth leadership initiatives in Arizona. I've also um, been a part of the Alumni Association. I was on the board of directors of the Versatility Incorporated, which is um, now the um, like what helps put on our YLF um, and is run by or is directed by Melly Santora. Um, and then I work as a um, peer-based service professional for Diversability Incorporated. I am the first alumni of Arizona Youth Leadership Forum to get a full-time position at um, Diversability Incorporated. So that was really awesome and a big honor. Um, I've used my self-advocacy um, to get a few awards. So I'm a national um, recipient of the Advocates and Disability Award in 2017. And I'm also the 2019 recipient of the Marcus Harris Jr. Harrison Jr. Leadership Award. Um, and I have um, also went to several different states um, as like Colorado, I believe there are a few states that have come to us and Alaska, I went to Alaska with Isaac to also help um, put on or teach them how to put on a YLF. So um, it's really amazing. And um, I've used everything that I learned from the YLF to get to meet where I am today. I also am a mother of three children and one of my children has um, autism. So I am now teaching her skills and um, giving her that heads up of like advocacy and teaching her that at a young age since she's only four. Um, so I've been using a lot of them <laughs> and I've gained a lot from Wyla. Wow, Anya, that's awesome. That's quite a story. Thank you for sharing all of that. And you definitely sound like you've 
been involved in a lot of different things. So that's fantastic. All right, you guys. Um, and I'm also noticing that a lot of people are putting in the chat how YLF has impacted them. That's really cool. I love to see that. Um, feel free to share your own experiences in the chat if you'd like to. Um, so we're going to move on to the next question. Uh, so this, again, this panel is about, you know, creating change and, and making change in our communities. And so I want to talk a little bit about you know, things that have been have needed to change in your own community. So the question is, what issues or barriers have each of you faced in your area, your city, your community, that kind of thing? And how have you overcome those barriers? So what what it, what barriers have you faced and how have you over, how have you overcome them? Um, does anyone I, specifically want to start with this question? I have a story for you. Okay, can you hold, um, at the end, we're gonna let others share and ask questions. Can you hold that for just a second while we hear from our panel members? I can start. Okay, go ahead, Isaac. So um, my disability is blindness. And so um, being in a affluent white neighborhood, I was one of a few people with physical disabilities. Um, and so, a, you know, one of the barriers was education. Um, that being that I didn't have accessible technology, uh, or excuse me, assistive technology, not accessible, but accessible works. Um, assistive technology. Um, I didn't have the, the tools to um, have Braille on demand. Um, I didn't have um, accommodating teachers at one point, And, you know, and that's and so, um, so school was a really struggle, a, str a struggle for me. Um, and, you know, part of it was that I felt at one point or another that I wasn't deserving of an education um, because I was, you know, different. I didn't look like everyone else. And so I really took that to heart and I, you know, started really, you know, slacking in my work. I didn't do any of it. I would just go home and um, sit at my desk for an hour, not doing anything because I didn't understand any of the assignments because I wasn't paying attention because I wasn't getting any, you know, I wasn't getting the assistance and the um, accessibility to learn. And so um, my mom noticed this and, you know, had a, had a chat with me about, you know, why, why am I, you know, being, being, you know, why, why am I doing this to myself? And I, you know, I explained it to her and her response was something along the lines of, um, you know, that's, that's ridiculous. You know, you have just as much right to an education as anyone else, especially being someone who is not from this country. Um, I am originally from China um, and I was, I was born in China and I was adopted in 2004. And a couple of days ago was my 18th anniversary of being in the United States as a, as a citizen. Um, and so, you know, I took that to heart and then I saw, and, and so I started to really push against the, the, the school, um, about, you know, for, to provide me the, the accommodations that I've asked and my parents, you know, backed me up and, you know, said that if they didn't fo follow my, um, my IEP and 504 plan that the school would have a lawsuit on their hand because it, the, my education was a, is, a, is federally protected. And if they couldn't accommodate something as simple as providing braille for me or giving me extra time on assignments or whatever the case was, that that's against the, um, the, the education act that protects students with disabilities. And so, that was, you know, something that I, you know, felt accomplished with is that I learned to become an, my, a self-advocate at a very young age. I think I was um, in the fourth, third, fourth grade when I really, like, started to take to the heart. And so um, by middle school, I was running, running my IEPs. I was, you know, explaining to teachers and, and um, uh, administrative uh, members of the school and board members of the school that if they were going to push back, I would just, I was going to push harder because I knew that my education was important and I really am, you know, I love to learn. I'm an academic at heart. Um, 
growing up in a family of of seven and you know that was something that I wanted to strive for and so I've pushed every boundary and I've pushed every ex an expectation for me and I've taken it and you know chucked it out the window because I wanted to set my own my own destiny and not let pre notions of of disability uh, determine where I was going to go in life and so with that determination I graduated the top 15 top 10 15 uh, percent in my graduating class in high school and I received awards and scholarships to go to a four-year college and I am very close from grad to graduating a, a f with a four-year degree and that is something that I will always cherish because that's something that I was told that I was not going to be able to do so you know hot to the you know haha -ha to the faces of people who doubted me they'll get where I am now absolutely Isaac that's awesome I love that Thank you. You kind of actually answered the next question, which was, how have you advocated for change? So you answered two questions in one. That's great. Um, so I'm going to go to someone else and, and I am going to kind of ask you guys to combine uh, the next two questions. So, you know, what's the barrier and how did you advocate for change in order to change that? So Kendra, it looks like you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to share? Well, I was going to kind of go off of the, my school's experience when I was in college. Um, uh, so I, I'm also, when I describe myself, I didn't, I'm three feet tall and I'm in a wheelchair, so I'm shorter. And so um, when I went to college, uh, I think sometimes when you're short and in a wheelchair, sometimes it throws people even more. So I had professors that, um, I was on a 504 when I was in grade school and everything. So when I went to college, I was already familiar with the 504 process. But, you know, like I ran into some professors that I feel like definitely judged me by the cover of the book, you know, the saying. Um, and so I would go to the disability coordinator on campus and she was not very helpful. She wasn't really um, the best. So, it was frustrating to me. So what I ended up doing in this for the advocating was I didn't want to have to deal with her. <laughs> so I took it upon myself each semester that when I would get who my professors were, I would email them and say, hi, my name is Kendra Gottsleben. I'm short <laughs> in a wheelchair. I'm an open book if you have questions. Please ask me, don't hesitate to, um, you know, feel awkward or anything, because I know sometimes people do. So I kind of took the initiative of nipping that in the butt so that when I came in the class the first day, you know, even though we hadn't always like physically met, at least they knew okay, I have someone in a wheelchair coming in the class or whatever. And so that was one of the things. But then also um, there was a professor who accused me of cheating. And so I would never cheat. But what I did was I wrote out a letter and kind of explained. Um, I mean, it's kind of advocacy, but, you know, I probably should have done it in person. But now that I'm older, I probably could do it in person. But just explaining how that my integrity is kind of what I've always had and that's very important to me. And when they question me cheating that I would never have done, you know, that you question my integrity. And so kind of the whole college experience is because I didn't want to deal with people that didn't really understand, you know, especially the disability coordinator, it forced me to take charge of how I wanted to have my classes go and everything. So that was a really big thing. And then from doing that, now that I'm older, I'm more comfortable and confident in, you know, asking for changes in things that I need. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you, Kendra. So I'm going to go to Anya and Nathan for our next question because we don't want to cut too much into our next speaker. But so the next question is, how would you encourage our alumni who may be hesitant to advocate 
for change. Um, what would you say to them to encourage them to be an advocate and fight for what they want? Um, Anya, what do you think about that? As a facilitator for our YLF, like most of the years that we've had our YLF, I think I already do this. Um, so it's pretty simple for me to answer this question. I tell them my story. I let them know. Some people aren't comfortable with doing that quite yet. So do whatever is comfortable with you. But for me, I'm comfortable enough and I've worked through my um, past enough to be able to tell people about my story and um, letting them know that it's okay to um, advocate for their needs and rights. So we go through trainings at our YLF about self-advocacy and self-determination skills. And so being able to talk to them about um, how important self-advocacy is, even in just daily life matters, um, one of the things that I've learned is you advocate for yourself from the time you were born, you are crying into your mother's chest um, for that warmth again, you're crying for milk, you're crying for food, you're crying to be held and touched and loved and, and that's advocacy. You're asking with that cry um, for help and, and to toddler years, your kids are whining and crying and um, but they, they have a reason why they're doing that, they're advocating themselves. So I, I always, Whenever I talk about advocacy, that's where I go. I, I talk about how important it is to nurture those advocacy skills from a young age. And if we've lost them, go ahead and nurture um, those advocacy skills back into them because it is so important for us who have disabilities to know that it's okay and it's good to advocate for yourself no matter the situation. And if your voice is not being heard, to speak louder because your voice is important and without it, um, you would be stuck in the place that you um, are not comfortable in. So continue to advocate for yourself no matter the situation and no matter how many times you've been turned away. That's usually the advice I give. That's great advice. Thank you, Anya. Nathan, what advice would you give to our budding advocates here? <laughs> so I don't know if, so, can you all hear me now? I'm sorry. My mic, is, okay. I would 100% yes. yes. agree with mm -hmm. everything that Anya just said. Advocacy is so many things, big and small. Uh, but I, I think the key is just remembering the most important thing, which is we need to be able to make our voices heard about the things that matter to us. And that if we do not demand a seat at the table, whether it's at a policy meeting or in our own lives, we're going to be on the menu because people are going to be deciding what is important for us. And that's no way to live our best lives. So it's really important to just have a broad look at what advocacy is. And if it's intimidating to speak out about big things, you can start about you can start by looking at the things in your life and you know determining what you like and don't like about them and make your voice heard about that and then if you decide that you want to do bigger things or pursue systemic issues you can talk to other people with disabilities and learn from shared experiences and maybe agree on the things yeah. that need to be changed. I know um, in my experience, I live in an area right now that has really limited access to public know. information. And sorry, I'm getting some feedback there, but I live in an area with limited yeah. access to public yeah. transportation. And one of the things I had to do is learn to organize local and regional groups of people. And we eventually worked with community stakeholders to get a ballot initiative on, and we got asked for more funding uh, for transportation. And in addition to that, we worked with other stakeholders to have our state Medicaid agency develop more funding streams for 
for person-centered transportation options and self-directed transportation options to have more choices for transportation that might be at off-peak hours. So it just, it's really about starting with smaller things and then figuring out what has your passion and progressing toward bigger items and working with other people to create change. Wow, thank, thank you, Nathan. That was really, really good advice. Thank you guys all for sharing your, your, your experiences and such really, really great advice for our alumni. I know that a lot of you guys have questions and I hate uh -huh. to do this, but we don't wanna cut too much into our, our next speaker. So if you have a question for the panel, if you'd like to put it in the chat, uh, panel members, if you guys can kind of keep an eye on the chat and see if someone had a question for you, um, that way we can kind of keep continue on, but also answer any questions that that uh, participants had for each of you. So I want to thank you guys all for being here and being a part of our panel. Again, you guys are perfect examples that advocacy is very much possible at any age um, and that it's so important to use our voices and speak up for things that are important to us especially as people with disabilities. So thank you guys so much for being a part of our panel. And like I said, go ahead and keep an eye on the chat. And I'm sure there are questions that people are gonna have for you all. Thank you guys so much. Can we have maybe some virtual claps for our panel? <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it back to Sarah. Thanks, Carrie. And thank you to all of our panelists too, um, Isaac, Anya. Kendra and Nate, we appreciate you all being with us this afternoon and taking time out of your busy schedules to come and share your experiences with us. Um, I feel like we could have talked all afternoon about the importance of advocacy and all the great changes that you all are making in your community. So again, feel free to keep dropping questions in the chat if you've got any questions for our panelists. So now is the most exciting time of our program. We are gonna end our program hearing from our keynote speaker, Jennifer Keelan Chafin. So I'm going to read her bio and give her an introduction, and then we will give her a big YLF national welcome. So Jennifer Keelan Chafin is a passionate advocate for the support and implementation of the Americans with Disabilities Act and an activist for disability rights. She joined the disability rights movement at age six, and at age eight, she participated in the famous Capitol Crawl which if you all have seen Crip Camp, you have probably seen Jennifer featured um, during that segment of Crip Camp. To protest and support the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In 1990, she received the Americans with Disabilities Act Award from the Task Force on the Rights and Empowerment of Americans with Disabilities. Today, Jennifer is an educator and a motivational speaker. And together with her newly illustrated biography called All the Way to the Top, how One Girl's Fight for Americans with Disabilities Changed Everything, Jennifer teaches audiences about the importance of the ADA, the Capitol Crawl, and the disability rights movement. This book was recognized in 2021 as a Schneider Family Book Award honor for the children's category zero to eight from the American Library Association, along with being a 2020 A Mighty Girl Best Book of the Year and a 2021 Eureka Honor Book Award, just to name a few. Jennifer is a proud owner of Jennifer Keelan Chafins LLC, which was established in May of 2020 and is recognized as a SAM.gov certified business owner. She currently lives in Colorado with her service dog, Maya, and a live-in aide. So Jennifer, we are so excited to have you. I know that so many of our panelists, um, or I'm sorry, our audience, has seen Crip Camp and has heard so much about your story. So we're excited to have you and hear more with what you have to share. Thank you, it's great to be here. Should we go ahead and pull up my, um, my PowerPoint presentation? Okay, can everyone see that? I can. Okay. I can too. Okay, great. Go ahead, Jennifer, it. and I'll change the slides whenever you tell me to. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you so much for inviting me today to speak with you and share my story. 
My sister Kaylee and I had experienced many forms of discrimination at a very young age and became aware of being separated because of my disability. For instance, when my mom was trying to find a daycare center, she was told that they would accept Kaylee because she was able-bodied and could walk, but that I would have to go to a separate daycare center because they were unable to take me due to my disability and there was no wheelchair access. So I attended a school named Tempe Center for the Handicap, and my sister went to a different daycare center. When it came time for me to start kindergarten, the neighborhood school that I could see from my front yard was not wheelchair accessible because there were no curb cuts or physical access that would accommodate my wheelchair, nor did the school have a special education program that could meet my needs. The same was true for public transportation. Kaylee, mom, and I had tried to use the public bus to go downtown, but were denied access and told that the lift was bolted down and was only there for show, but not to use, to make it look like they were complying with the federal mandate set forth by the Urban Mass Transit Act of 1970. The act mandated that all new buses be equipped with lifts, but this mandate was not being recognized or enforced. And that was the reason why we were denied access to the bus. And on this second slide, this is a picture of me, my little sister Kaylee, and we attended, we are attending a protest in Atlanta, Georgia in 1989, protesting the lack of wheelchair accessible buses for public transportation. Both Kaylee and I were learning sign language at the time. So we are both signing access now in this photo. And I have two protest signs attached to my wheelchair. One says, stop discrimination now with a sticker that says, give me a lift. And the other says, Greyhound is a dirty dog. Please move to slide three. I was introduced to disability rights when I was six years old. The disability rights group ADAPT National came to Phoenix, which was where I was living at the time, to protest the lack of wheelchair accessible buses. My mom's cousin, Tom Olin, and family friend, Diane Coleman, came to Phoenix to attend the protest and stayed at our house. They invited mom and I and sister Kaylee to attend the protest and strategy meetings. And we were excited to see what the protests were all about. When I first met ADAPT and co-founder Wade Blank and other members of the disability rights movement, it was the first time I'd ever seen other people with disabilities, just like myself, who were fighting for their civil rights and the right to be treated like everyone else with dignity and respect and the right to have full and equal access to all areas of society. I learned that having a disability could be very empowering. This is where Kaylee and I learned that separate is not equal and Brown versus the Board of Education of 1954. This is also where we learned about the 504 Rehab Act of 1973 and about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA. To Kaylee and I, that meant that we did not have to be separated from each other. We could go to the same school together and ride the bus together. Both Kaylee and I decided that we wanted to become involved in the movement. And by the end of the weekend, I was leading the protest through the streets of downtown Phoenix. And on the third slide, this is a picture of my mom, my sister Kaylee, and me with Bob Kafka from ADAPT National. And we are at a very first protest in Phoenix, Arizona. We are all being interviewed by a Phoenix reporter. Please move to slide four. At our second protest in San Francisco, we met many of the iconic leaders of the movement. This included Justin Dart Jr., the father of the ADA, and members of the Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund, or DREDF, including Judy Human, who is known for the 504 sit-in protest, and Ed Roberts, one of the leaders of the independent living movement. 
These were my teachers and my mentors growing up. They taught me how to fight and stand up for my civil rights and the civil rights of others. And the lessons that they taught me would play a pivotal role in shaping me into the person that I am today. And on slide four, this is a picture of Justin Dart and me, Jennifer Keelan Chaffins, and my mom, Cynthia Keelan, and Bob Kafka, and Diane Coleman. And we are protesting in San Francisco in 1987. Please move to slide five. We were introduced to the Task Force on the Rights and Empowerment of Americans with Disabilities, created by Congressman Major Owens, headed by Justin Dart Jr., which would be the beginning of the passage of the journey to the ADA. The task force had begun their mission by collecting testimony from people with disabilities and their experiences with discrimination. Included in the testimony were the expectations of what we would like to see in the ADA and what protections the ADA would be able to address. Thousands of participants from all 50 states were asked to share their stories. My family and I were invited to participate and gave our testimony. These oral and written testimonies would later be called the ADA Diaries and would assist in establishing a record of discrimination that Justin would eventually submit to Congress. And on slide five, this is a picture of Justin and I at a protest in Washington, DC, and he is handing me a bouquet of carnations. Please move to slide six. United States Senate, Americans with Disabilities Act, September 18th, 1989. Even though the Senate had already passed the ADA, the House was still stalling its full passage. As Adaptive Arizona, Mom and I and Kaylee were in regular contact with Senator John McCain's office about updates regarding the ADA's full passage. The next slide is a letter from Senator McCain addressed to my mom regarding the importance of the ADA and his full support of its passage. Please move to slide seven. Dear Cynthia, due to your interest in the legislation affecting disabled Americans, I would like to take this opportunity to update you on the status of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1989. I was proud to have been one of the primary authors of this landmark measure. As you may know, on September 7th, 1989, the Senate voted 76 to eight in favor of the ADA. I was pleased to see this overwhelming vote of confidence in support of this legislation. For far too long, the disabled have been left out of the mainstream of our communities. And I believe that Congress has an obligation to end this legal discrimination. The ADA is a necessary first step as we seek to open our communities to all who wish to participate. The path towards eliminating the disparity that exists between those who are disabled and those who are not has been an arduous one. However, I am pleased to see that Congress is now showing the political will to correct this inequity. The House will soon be considering this bill and I have been told that the president hopes to sign this legislation into law later this fall. For your information, I have enclosed my statement from the congressional record. We must make sure that the goals of our founding fathers, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness be made available to all Americans. Sincerely, John McCain, United States Senator. Please move to slide eight. 
March 12th, 1990, the Capitol crawl. In response to this delay, disability rights groups from across the country organized to come together in Washington, DC and use their voices to tell Congress why it was important to pass the ADA without any further delay. This led to the Wheels of Justice March on Washington, DC, the rally that was to follow and led to the Capitol crawl. By this time, I had become a seasoned activist and had already been protesting for two years. When I decided to do the Capitol crawl, I realized that as one of the few young children who got to be so closely involved in this movement, I was not just representing myself, but I was representing my generation and future generations of kids with disabilities. So I was more determined than ever to make sure that I reached the top so that all of our voices would be heard. And on July 26, 1990, the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed into law by President George H.W. Bush. And on slide eight, this is my personal photo of the Capitol crawl on March 12th, 1990. In the photo, I am crawling up the second half of the Capitol building steps. I am surrounded by reporters with cameras and other adults with disabilities, and we are all crawling up the steps of the Capitol together. Alongside me holding the styrofoam cup is a young man who was my attendant that day. We are all wearing a turquoise adapt t-shirt with the words wheels of justice. A large crowd of people are gathered at the bottom of the steps watching the protest. Please move to slide nine. Here is my White House invitation and ticket to the signing of the Americans with Disabilities Act on July 26, 1990. The invitation says, the White House, July 18th, 1990. Dear friend, on behalf of the president, we invite you to participate in the signing ceremony of the Americans with Disabilities Act. The president will sign this historic legislation on Thursday, July 26, 1990 at 10 a.m. on the South Lawn of the White House. This is a very special occasion and we hope you can join us. The day that the ADA was signed into law was also the day that people with disabilities gained their independence, dignity, and their civil rights. It was the day that people with disabilities were fully recognized and acknowledged as fellow citizens and human beings who have the right to fully participate in all aspects of society with dignity and respect, and therefore were no longer excluded. It truly was a historic day. And for this reason, it is also known as Second Independence Day. Please move to slide 10. The ADA is now 32 years old, and although more public spaces are accessible, there is still more work to be done. We must continue to use our voices and speak up and speak out to create positive change for full equality and access and full participation in the American dream under the ADA 504 and all the disability rights laws. Remember, the ADA is not just about physical access. It is also about personal empowerment and what it means to you and how it can empower you to use your voice to enforce and exercise your rights or the rights of your friends and family members. For example, if you need accommodations for school or at work or for housing, or if you need to enforce your existing accommodations, you should never be afraid to use your voice to advocate for yourself and your needs or to advocate for others. When you speak up and advocate for yourself and others, you are not only empowering yourself, you are also empowering and creating a pathway for the next person. There is more to this law than what is written into it. We are the ones who give it its strength. 
And we are the ones as leaders in our communities responsible for passing it on and empowering the next generation. On slide 10, this is a picture of me once I reached the top of the steps of the Capitol and my mom is giving me a big hug. Please move to slide 11. In the task force's final letter, Justin Dart Jr. in the task force says, celebrate the ADA, shout its message in living rooms, schools, churches, businesses, communities, governments, and public media. Implement the ADA. Keep the promises of the ADA by creating a cultural environment in which all people with disabilities can empower themselves as equal and protective participants in the American dream. Let us unite in action as never before. Together we have overcome, together we shall overcome. Please move to slide 12. Teaching disability history to the next generation. The disability rights movement is an important part of American history that is rarely discussed and taught in the classroom. I want to change that. I believe that kids and educators will learn and be empowered by this important part of America's history. Please move to slide 13. All the way to the top. All the way to the top is an illustrated bibliography children's book and my true story about my involvement in the disability rights movement, as well as my participation in the Capitol crawl from my eight-year-old point of view. I worked together with Annette Bay Pimentel, the author, Nabi H. Ali, the illustrator, and Source Books, the publisher of this book for three years. I also wrote the foreword for this book myself. So to together, we captured my eight-year-old voice perfectly. It does a wonderful job of opening the door to the conversation of the disability rights movement and the importance of the ADA to young children and their families. Please move to slide 14. The book comes with a downloadable Common Core State Standard Align Activity Guide for grades one through five that is free to download on both my website, jkclegacy.com, as well as Sourcebook's website. In this fun and exciting activity guide, kids will learn how to, please move to slide 15. How to recognize and handle bullying, just a friend waiting to happen. The activity guide emphasizes the importance of the statement, just a friend waiting to happen when I am being bullied and teased by my classmates at school. As a class or home activity, students are encouraged to discuss what it means to be just a friend waiting to happen and whether they would feel the same way. They are encouraged to adopt the phrase as a class motto while they are reading and studying the book and think about how this could positively change the way they see the world and other people and why it is important to have empathy and understand the way someone else is feeling. Please move to slide 16. Recognizing barriers and discrimination. Exclusion and inclusion are important concepts in the book. The book uses the word stop to illustrate when I'm being confronted with barriers and discrimination and exclusion. Students are encouraged to identify what physical things stop me from fully participating, what non-physical things stop me, and how do I empower myself when I'm being confronted with a barrier. Please move to slide 17. How to recognize accessibility. The book uses the word go to illustrate full inclusion, participation, and accessibility. As a class or home activity, the activity guide encourages students to explore their neighborhoods and take photos to, to identify accessibility features and accommodations 
in their own neighborhood and their day-to-day -day lives. And they are encouraged to share their discoveries with their class. Please move to slide 18. The importance of self-advocacy and creating accessible pathways. One, disability pride and acceptance. Two, empowerment and confidence. And three, self-determination. The book also introduces the concept of self-advocacy and its importance for all children with and without disabilities. It is important for children to learn at a young age how to effectively communicate and negotiate their interests, desires, needs, and rights. When we, are encouraged, when we encourage students to develop self-advocacy skills, students create their own accessible pathways for self-determination, confidence, empowerment, and disability pride, and in turn, become more effective in creating accessible pathways for others. In the words of Justin Dart, disability is a normal part of the human experience. And we, when we empower ourselves, we are able to empower others. Please move to slide 19. The ADA is our tool to personal empowerment. Many believe that when the ADA was passed into law, that enforcement would be automatic and understood. But from my personal experience, since the passage of the ADA in 1990, I can tell you that I have had to continue to fight for my rights and accommodations. And I've had to learn about self-advocacy and personal empowerment in order to exercise and enforce my rights under the ADA. The ADA is our tool, but we are the ones who give it its power. Please move to the final slide. And now I would like to end my presentation by reading a portion of President Bush's ADA signing ceremony speech found in Work Life, a publication on employment and people with disabilities. Fall 1990, Volume 3, Number 3, ADA Special Issue. The ADA is a dramatic renewal, not only for those with disabilities, but for all of us. Because along with the precious privilege of being American comes the sacred duty to ensure that every other American's rights are also guaranteed. Together, we must remove the physical barriers that we have created and the social barriers that we have accepted. For ours will never be truly a prosperous nation until all within it prosper. Thank you all very much. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Great, this is Sarah. Thank you so much, Jennifer. We have about 10 minutes. So if it's okay, um, we are gonna do a Q and A um, for some of the participants in the chat. Does that work for you? Yes, that'll be great. Okay, great. So I see one question in the chat. Um, it is from somebody from California. Let's see, let me, I lost the question. She says, oh goodness, hold on. Okay, what you? made you decide to Sarah? crawl up the stairs? That is an excellent question. And for me, um, because I got to be <laughs> so closely involved in the disability rights movement, and I joined at a very young age, I felt it was my duty to not only represent myself, but to represent my generation and future generations of kids with disabilities. And that is what gave me the determination and the strength to make it up those steps, no matter how long it took me, uh, because I knew that it wasn't just about myself, but it was about them as well. And making sure that not only my voice was heard, but their voice was heard as well. Absolutely. I agree. 
And then Isabella would like to know what inspired you? Oh goodness, Carrie, I might need you to help me with some of these questions. Um, the chat is going so quickly. For you? So yeah, if you can read one, that'd be great. Oh, sure. What inspired you to be involved in the movement from Isabella? I, both my sister and I had experienced um, discrimination at a very young age. And we wanted to um, change that. And when Kaylee and I met the disability rights movement, we thought, you know, we thought that this was a, a perfect venue for us to use our voices to create that change and to represent um, kids everywhere. Because it's it wasn't just the adults that were being discriminated against, but it's also um, kids that are being discriminated against too. And so we felt that this was um, our vehicle to do that, to use our voices to create that change. And so when, when both Kaylee and I um, became involved in the disability rights movement, we felt um, very honored because we felt that it was a excellent space for, um, for us to do that. Awesome. We have another question in the chat. What led you to telling your story and making it into a book? I was contacted by Annette um, Bay Pimentel, the author, and Source Books when I was in my last semester of college at ASU. And she contacted me and she wanted to um, write my story to tell um, young kids the importance of the ADA and the Capitol Crawl. And she, um, when she contacted me, I was ecstatic because I always wanted to um, have a children's book um, tell my story because, as I said in my presentation, this is a very important part of our history, and it is rarely talked about or um, discussed in the classroom. And I want to change that because I believe that this needs to change um, in order to um, empower the next generation and 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 pass it on to them. And so when Annette contacted me with the opportunity, um, you know, I jumped on it. And so the rest is history. It took us about three years, um, and we did uh, consultations with Nobby, the illustrator, and with Source. And the other thing that I that was very important to me was I wanted it to be a, a teaching tool to to um, teach the next generation uh, about the importance of the disability rights movement. And so that's why I'm so proud that it has a Common Core Line Teacher's Guide that comes with it for grades one through five, um, because um, you know that this is an excellent way to to start that conversation. Absolutely, I love that it is, has a curriculum guide that's able to be universal across the board for all grade levels for the younger grades. That's great. Um, we've got another question: What worries do you have today that you want people to know about? So, for example, laws, new prejudices, etc. You know, that is an excellent question. And I, I think that it's more important um, than ever, especially now, even though the ADA is passed, to continue to use our voices, to continue to advocate for, um, for that change. Because it is when we speak up and speak out together that change occurs. And so this is why it is so important to you know, continue um, to advocate, even you know, even after the ADA is passed, that it's even more important to do that now than it was then, um, because it's like I said, it's our voices that will continue to create that change, and and you know, the ADA is our tool, and so this is why it's important that we continue to use that self-advocacy and continue to teach the next generation to empower them um, because it, it is our tool. And that's why it's important that we, you know, that we continue on um, advocacy um, more than ever, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. Yeah, it's all about leading the way for the next generation. You're absolutely right. George, I see that you have your hand up. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you since you have your camera on. You would like to go ahead and unmute and ask Jennifer your question. Great, thank you. Can, can you hear me? 
Go ahead. Can you hear me? Can you, can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Was, okay, thank you. I wanted to make sure. Okay, so one my question is, what skills do you think are important for a for a advocate? I think that you know being able to um, to um, tell others um, what you what you need to succeed and what um, what accommodations you need. Also, being able to um, being able to speak to all the members of your your education team or your medical team and making sure that everyone is on the same page and everyone um, acknowledges and understands you know your desires and and what you need to succeed whether it's in the school environment the college environment the work environment it's very very important that um that you be able to um continue to um to do that because when you when you do that you're not only advocating for yourself at that point but you will be a strong advocate for for others as well thank you very much and you're my you're part of my heroes list thank you you're welcome thanks george all right jennifer i see somebody with their hand up and we'll take two more questions from the chat um, and then we'll wrap it up. So Jamie, I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight you. You would like to unmute and ask your question to Jennifer. So I'm actually not my mom. I'm actually Grace Sanchez. And Hi, my question is that, how can you have so much empowerment power from the 1990 to here? I had fabulous teachers and mentors. Oh, wow. Awesome. I, you I are have, also one of my heroes, too, from, also from Judy, too. Judy is your hero, too. So both of you guys are my heroes. <laughs> I, I had um, my, my teachers and my mentors are the ones that, um, you know, gave me a lot of confidence and not only taught me how to fight, for my rights and taught me how to advocate for myself and advocate for my needs. But they also taught me how to advocate for the needs of others. And um, that's also very important. And so, okay. um, you know, my mentors were Judy Human, Justin Dart, Ed Roberts, Wade Blank. Um, you know, these were my teachers and my mentors and they are the ones who taught me Awesome. Awesome. Oh, I think Jesse has a question. Okay, we will go ahead and spotlight you, Jesse. We will get to you. Um, and then we will ask one more question because I think that is all we are going to have time for. Jesse, go right ahead. Sorry. No, it's okay. Go ahead. Ms. Jennifer, I have two questions for you. What was your experience like at Crip Camp? And my second question are you and Judy human still friends? Well, I wasn't born during Crip Camp, so I didn't necessarily go to Crip Camp, but at the end of the movie, it shows, um, it shows aspects of the Capitol crawl. So if you um, look at the end of the movie, that little girl that did the, the, that crawled up the Capitol steps, that was me. And so, yes, I've known Judy Human since I was six years old, and, um, and we still, um, Occasionally, we'll um, we will do things together. I recently did a um, interview with PBS uh, Books um, Detroit and uh, Girl Scouts, and it was for their Access for All campaign. Um, and they were going to interview both Judy Human and me um, for this campaign. And so, and then there's also. The, um, the podcast that I did with Judy uh, as well. I think that was last year or two years ago. And so, yes, um, we still, we still um, 
um, talk to each other um, quite a lot. So. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks, Jesse. All right, Jennifer, I'm just going to read a couple more questions in the chat as we wrap this up. So it looks like Isaiah would like to know what is the most oppressing issue for the disability community, do you believe? I think that, um, you know, there, there are a lot of, you know, even though that the ADA is now 32 years old, it will be 32 on, on, on the 26th, um, there's still a lot more work to be done. Our work is not finished. And, um, you know, this is the reason why it is so important that we continue to use our voices and that we continue to, um, you know, to, to raise issues that need to change. Because change only occurs when we speak up and speak out. And so, and so I think it's, it's very, very important that we, um, that we continue on the work because I know from personal experience that our you know our work isn't done yet and now we're now we're in phase two and we're in the implementation phase um, of the ADA and so um, you know one of the one of the things that I know um, everybody is working on is making sure that you know our voices are still heard making sure that we, um, that we are um, invited to the table and making sure that, that our input is, is, um, is recognized in, um, in um, new policies and um, new, new issues. Uh, and so I think that this is the reason why it's so important even more today that we continue to speak up and speak out. Yeah, we have a lot of work left to do. I mean, the ADA is a start, but I feel like there's so much more that we've got to do. So as we wrap up, I just want to combine maybe two questions together. Um, Thomas asked, what are your hopes for the future of advocacy and disability rights? And then I would love for you to share any advice or wisdom that you would give to some of our young alumni who are in the advocacy field, any tips that you have for them. So what are your hopes uh, for the future for disability rights and what advice would you give to our participants that are here today? Um, for me, I believe that it is, it's, it's very important um, that we um, you know, continue on the, the education of, of the ADA and of all disability rights laws of 504 Olmstead you know, these, these are laws and precedents um, that have been put into place to make sure that we um, can fully participate and make sure that our voices are heard. And so I think that it, it's, it's very, very, very important. Um, and I can't stress this enough. We, it is our voices that will uh, ensure that the, um, ADA continues for generations because it is our voices that will bring the ADA and continue to bring the ADA to the forefront and continue to bring our voices and our input to the forefront. Um, you know, there's, there's a saying in the disability community and that is nothing about us without us. And I believe what they are saying in that is you know, we must continue to make sure that our voices are heard, that our input is heard, that we have um, people with disabilities in areas of policy making, in areas of, 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 of um, government interests. I think that that's what that means, because if we don't speak up and speak out, then there is that there is that possibility that things will be done about us without us, and so this is why it's very very important that we as a community and we as leaders continue to you know use our voices to you know to create that change and make sure that um, that our input is at the forefront. Absolutely. And, and so um, for me. 
this is why it's so important to um, continue to uh, teach the next generation, empower the next generation, and, and continue to, um, you know, let them know that the ADA is our tool. It is a tool that we use to empower ourselves. It is a tool that we use to enforce our rights because the ADA um, gives us and, and our, our rights. And so, you know, that's why it's important that, um, that we continue to use our voices and, and continue to use ADA as that tool. So much great wisdom that you have shared. And I, I just want everyone to know that is here exactly what you shared, nothing about us without us, because of our voices and we are not sitting at those places where decision makers are making those decisions. I know Nate was on our panel earlier and he talked about that as well. Um, it's so important for people with disabilities to be representing at the table, because without that, you know, all these decisions are gonna be made without our consent and without that. So Jennifer, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. Um, for all of you that are here, check out Jennifer's children's book. Um, Jennifer, can they find that on Amazon? Is your book on Amazon? Yes, they can buy it at every major bookstore retailer. Um, you can find it on Amazon, Target, Walmart, Barnes and Noble, um, and, um, and pretty much all major booksellers carry it. Great. And I know that you uh, will be having some merchandise coming out in a couple of weeks. So stay tuned for that. Where can they follow you to find out more about where to find that? Um, I should have um, my merchandise and my special edition celebrating ADA uh, 32 t-shirts up and running. I'm hoping by the end of this week, maybe possibly by the beginning of next week, but you can find um, um, information about uh, my special edition t-shirts on my website, jkclegacy.com. And it's on the coming soon page. And I did all of the artwork on the um, t-shirt myself. And so I'm, I'm very proud of that. On the front of the t-shirt is my logo. And then on the back of the t-shirt is um, a drawing that I did of Justin Dart Jr., the father of the ADA. And the last part of um, of the task force's final letter. Awesome, great. Well, we will be sure to drop those links in so people know where to find you. And thank you again for just spending time with us this afternoon and sharing all of your life experiences, especially as we celebrate the ADA's anniversary next week. Thank you. All right, so I am gonna turn it back over to Carrie. Carrie's gonna close us out. Carrie, I don't know about you, but I feel like Today has been such an encouragement for me to want to go out and just make some change. And I see we have in the chat um, somebody saying we all need to become politically savvy and go meet with our political leaders. So I feel like, you know, no matter how old you are or what your disability is or how long you've been involved in the YLF alumni groups, you have all the ability to go out and make change. So that's something that really stood um, out to me today as we were having this event. I don't know about for you, but I'll turn it over to you and let you close this out. Thank you, Sarah. I am definitely fired up from today's event. That is for sure. Thank you all who have been with us today. You guys have been fantastic. I'm so excited to see so many people here with us today. I, I also saw a comment that said, we are the disability community. And you're exactly right. Um, I think it's important to know that like one person can make a difference for sure. So as individuals, you guys can make change. You can make things happen in your communities, but also together as a disability community and as a YLF family from across the nation, we can make so much change. Um, we can really change this world. And so I encourage you guys to, to always remember that your YLF family is, is here. Uh, no matter what state you're in, we are all family. We definitely say that in our, our own state, but just know that you have a family from across this nation that is here to support you and, and also help you in making the changes that you wanna make. So a couple of things I wanna do as we wrap up today, um, I'd like to thank our sponsors and our supporters. Uh, one of those being the California Youth Leadership Forum, um, also known as the California Committee 
on employment of people with disabilities. They have helped in various ways to make this event possible. And so we definitely want to thank them. I would also like to thank the planning committee who um, helped to bring this event together. Uh, it may seem simple to bring together a virtual event, but it's not simple. And it's definitely not simple when many of the people on the complaint, the planning committee are planning for their own state YLFs. So I definitely want to thank our entire planning committee, especially Sarah, for uh, moderating today. I also want to thank Daniel for the behind the scenes stuff going on today and our entire planning committee who has been a part of making this possible for you guys. Um, there's a lot of hard work that has been put into making today possible. And we definitely hope to do this again in the future. So let's talk about the future. Um, so the Association of Youth Leadership Forums definitely has opportunities for you guys to get involved. Uh, I do encourage you to, of course, stay involved on a state level with your own youth leadership forum in your state. But I also encourage you to consider being involved on a national level. So we are currently uh, actually looking for a couple of alumni who would like to serve on our executive committee for the AYLF, um, which would basically entail, you know, coming to meetings each month or as many as you can um, and, and providing your feedback on a national level of how we can engage our alumni more, um, you know, what, what things should we be doing as a national organization? And so if you would like to apply to be a part of that executive committee and be kind of our alumni youth representatives, um, I should have grabbed the link for you guys to fill out the form. I did not do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the chat right now my contact information. Sherry, this is Sherry, you're muted. That was weird, sorry about that. I must've hit something. So I just put my contact information in the chat box. So if you are interested in getting involved on a national level, please feel free to shoot me an email and I will get you the link to fill out the form to get involved on a national level. I've also put our website for the Association of Youth Leadership Forums. So if you'd just like to learn more about what we do, you can definitely go there and, and check out more about what we do as a national organization. Um, so there's the opportunity to be a part of our executive committee. There's also just opportunities to attend our AYLF meetings on a monthly basis and kind of represent your state if you'd like to do that. Also, if you really liked this event today and you'd like to help us plan future virtual events, which we hope to have this definitely once a year, um, please shoot me an email about that as well, because we would love to have some alumni uh, as part of our planning committee. So if you'd like to help us out in the future with planning these events, uh, please shoot me an email and I'll get you uh, involved in that. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters today. I would like to thank um, all of you who have come as a participant today. I hope that you enjoyed this event. I hope that you gained some really good knowledge from it and um, just a motivation to go out there and make a difference. And again, know that you're not alone. You have a family from across this nation who is here ready to support you. So I hope if you gain nothing else from today, that that is definitely something that you are feeling as you leave this event today. I'd like to thank um, any YLF staff who are here, any YLF organizers, and again, our planning committee for making this possible. Trying to make sure I covered everything. I think we got everything. Sarah, is there anything else you'd like to mention? I think that that is all. I just want to say thank you again to all of you who were here today and joined us. Um, I know, like Carrie mentioned, that a lot of us are in the middle of our YLF. So the fact that you all took the time out to come out was great. I know I am feeling really excited about the future of what all of you are going to do. So I really hope that today was a jump start and a kick to all the great things you're gonna do in your communities, whether you're a first time delegate or you have been a staff for many years and you're a volunteer and mentor. Use the speakers, um, the alumni that were here today, really use that as fuel to go out and make that change in your community. All right, well, thank you everybody so much and we will see you all hopefully next year. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, guys. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Oh, I think I have one more question. I put it in the chat. 
but I have one more question. Did somebody said that they had a question? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Not. Somebody said something, but I also have an. What does. So do we have to travel? What. I forgot what she said, though. About YLF, the international or whatever it's called. Um, are there um, any events I should be. That they're, they're coming up that I should be aware of? Here, you want to take that one? Should be aware of. Um, there's not necessarily anything that AYLF is doing currently, other than we will be starting back up our monthly um, virtual calls that we have. So if you have an interest in, again, getting more involved on a national level, you can definitely find my email that I put in the chat and let me know that you're interested in getting more involved on a national level and we can invite you to those calls. Um, and so again, we will start planning for next year's virtual event as well, if you'd like to help us start planning for that. Um, and then someone was asking about traveling. I'm not sure what that question, traveling for this organization, or do you wanna clarify that a little bit more? The YLF, some, someone said something about international, I think. International, I, I must've missed that. Um, I, don't I don't think know. we talked about international, so I'm not, I'm not sure what that was. I'm sorry. <laughs> Fine. And we do have our national wildlife, which is what this is. So maybe that was what they were referring to and how you can find ways to become a part mm -hmm. of what we're doing here with our national wildlife. Um, how often do you, um, do, um, na national meetings? Uh, yeah, so our coordinator group meets monthly, uh, virtually through Zoom. So we basically just kind of get together and discuss, well, our, our first one coming up probably in, I'd say August or September, we will kind of just be discussing how our state YLFs went and good and bad and everything in between. Um, so, but we do that monthly. We just have a different topic each month and alumni um, uh -huh. can join us, you know, a representative from each state can join us any of those months. So. If you want to do that, again, you can shoot me an email, or if you just want to talk to your state leader, they can get you involved in that as well. Okay. Also, just what, um, this is Donna, just want to mention that um, if you're interested, you should probably look into your local community. Maybe they are having um, an ADA celebration. I know a lot of local communities are celebrating that. If you have independent living centers in your area, or if you just probably Google ADA celebration, whatever your town is, 2022, you might be able to find something. Yes. Thank you, Donna. That's a really good point. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for joining us. I, For those of you that are with California, I'm sure you'll be continuing on in a few minutes, but we will see you all later. Thank you so much. Thank you for, um, for the presentation.